Welcome to The Alcove. I'm Mark Malero. My guest today is Paul Levinson. He is Chair of Communications and Media Studies at Fordham University here in New York City. He is also the author of both fiction and nonfiction books. His nonfiction works include the books The Soft Edge, A Natural History and Future of the Information Revolution and Digital McLuhan. He has been interviewed over 500 times in various TV and radio appearances. Welcome. Good to be here. Um, it's interesting because you've appeared in virtually uh, every form of media that I can even imagine. I know with television you've been on you know, something like the, you know, the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. Mm -hmm. You've also recently been, been on now Bill O'Reilly's show. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could give us kind of a sense of where you think media is right now because it's a very complicated world right now. There's a lot of media chaos yeah. going on, but it's, it's an interesting time. You'll be happy to hear. I think media are going in the direction of exactly what you are doing. I'm but, very happy to hear yeah, that. Yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because as uh, much fun as it is to be on the news hour or you know to be on the O'Reilly Factor and be told to shut up and stuff like that. Right, and he did do that on the radio. He did do right? that on the radio, right, okay. just last week. I'm really honored now. I mean, I, You've been I'm christened. Think, that's right. I almost <laughs> feel like putting up, you know, not a blog roll, but an honor roll of people who have been told to shut up. I'm probably the least important. I mean, he's told some much more important people to <laughs> shut up, like Al Franklin. Right. But I'm, I'm pleased to be in their company. Yeah. But I, I think it's crystal clear, really, that... Uh, First of all, conventional broadcast television is on its way down. And I never cheer the demise of a medium, but on the other hand, they pretty much you know, had a, a stranglehold on a certain level of discourse going back really to the late 1940s, as radio did before that. Right. And cable television began making inroads on that in the 90s. But nowadays, actually, uh, as far as I can tell, the action is on the internet. It's on Blip TV, mm -hmm. the alcove. It's on YouTube. Look at the Obama girl video, all the impact and good sure. or bad that that did. Yeah. And it, it, this is where the consumer can at last become a producer. Mm -hmm. That's the key. The problem with the mass media were, was always that there was a, a really negative asymmetrical relationship in which you had a handful of producers and a huge number of consumers. And, you know, they tried to disguise that. Uh, you know, the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. Right. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think so. It's really all the news that a small group of editors at the New York Times deems fit to print, but that doesn't scan that well. Hmm. Or Walter Cronkite, you know, and that's the way it was. Right. It's not true. It's really, and that's the way a small band of editors here at CBS News thought you should think it was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and the mass media still have a role because they're so easy. It's still easier to turn on a television than, you know, get to a computer. But even that's beginning to vanish. I mean, people now have iPhones, Blackberries you can get on the web. Mm -hmm. almost instantly. So I think that's really what's happening. Now how do you think uh, what some are calling kind of a nicheification, so to speak, with all the podcasts and all the global new media, how do you think that will actually transform the traditional mass media? Do you think it will adapt or do you think uh, perhaps it might be a bit of a dinosaur? Do you think that it's capable of the kind of change that, that some hope that it might? Well, that's an interesting question. I think there is an aspect of the mass media which are very similar to the theatrical model. There was a time in Shakespeare's time when theater was the only way you could see that kind of public narrative performance. Mm -hmm. And although as much as I love theater, let's face it, it really hasn't done all that well in terms of reaching millions and millions of people in an age of motion pictures and television. Right. So I think there is that aspect to the mass media. But I also do think that the mass media are highly adoptable and they have something going for them. In the end, it's the same video, it's the same screen. So for example, something like the alcove which is now on blip tv now on the internet mm -hmm. i wouldn't be at all surprised if sooner or later some mass medium came along to you and said how would you like you know the alcove to be on our airways and sure. you would certainly say yes because you want to increase your audience there there are now actually beginning on the internet uh, several uh, news operations television stations which are in effect recruiting material mm -hmm. in a youtube like fashion so that they can play them on their television. Looking for new talent, in yeah, essence. Yeah, that's okay. right. And so to the extent that the media are adoptable in that way, and radio to some extent draws on podcasts, 
I think that uh, there is a future for mass media, but it'll be very different from what it's been so far. Yeah, and it's interesting um, when you look at things. Do you think that in the long term we will be, uh, you know, far richer for a lot of, as you're saying, consumers becoming producers? Because there must be a dark side to this this new uh, medium. The idea that there is, you know, too much information, for instance, uh, too much superfluous information. Uh, do you think the power of search? Do you think? Uh, the power of the technology will allow us to find the kind of media that we want without being overwhelmed? Well, first of all, I don't think there is such a thing as information overload. Okay. What people are talking about when they worry about that is really information underload. Hmm. And a, a way of realizing this is if you walk into a bookstore or a library, there are clearly a myriad more books than you can possibly even think about. Absolutely. But yet you don't really feel overwhelmed. You may feel sometimes a brief twinge of where should I look, but basically you know, most you know, people are fundamentally comfortable in bookstores and libraries. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because since we were kids, we were taught the rules of navigating bookstores and libraries. Mm -hmm. The thing that's frightening about all this information is we don't know how to navigate it. As soon as we learn how to navigate it, then it becomes effortless and actually inspiring and enlightening. So how do we do that? That's the thing. Yeah. Well, I think it's happening already. Okay. I mean, I think that Google is justifiably successful. I know there are a lot of people, uh, from my perspective, they're almost paranoid. They're afraid Google is taking over the earth. Uh, <laughs> I had some students once trying to convince me of that. But the fact is they're not doing that at all. And what they and other people working on various improved search methods are doing is bringing it all together. And Google itself has evolved. You know, nowadays on Google you can search for things in blogs, search for things in newspapers, search for things in video, search for books, right. in addition to everything else that's on the web. So it's never been easier hmm. and it's continuing to improve. I don't really see a dark side to this. You know, the only darkness that ever exists, unfortunately, is the darkness in humanity, mm -hmm. meaning that we are capable of bad things as well as good things. And, you know, if you think of technology as being a knife, we can use it to cut food, but people can use it to cut people. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no technology that's ever been invented that is immune from bad uses. I mean, think about medicine. That seems like to be just good, but yet some lunatics figured out how to make it into germ warfare. Right. That wouldn't have happened before Louis Pasteur and that whole revolution in biology. And on the other hand, what's the worst technology we can think of? Nuclear weapons. But obviously, you know, nuclear energy can have good uses as well. So mm -hmm. it's a question of how we use it. And I'm in favor of empowering people because I think by and large, the good usually succeeds over the bad. Yeah. It's interesting, in your book, uh, Digital McLuhan, you talk about the legacy, the ideas of Marshall McLuhan. And it's interesting because, you know, I think he died in 1980. What do you think that he would say about the age that we're in right now? I mean, the whole thing of the medium is the message. Um, would this, would the world that we're in here right now, 2007, 2008, would this be amongst what he would have predicted? Or is this maybe even beyond what he would have suggested. I think McLuhan would be as comfortable in this world as we are, maybe even more comfortable. Hmm. In fact, having known McLuhan for a few years near the end of his life, it was crystal clear to me he was not comfortable in the world in which he lived. That's one of the reasons why people had trouble even relating to him as a scholar. All of his writings were attempts in both content and form to break beyond the networked print-bound, early television boundaries that existed in his day. That's why if you right. pick up a copy of the Gutenberg Galaxy, it's not a conventional book. And, you know, he was talking about things like the Global Village, which in fact didn't exist in the 1960s when he was talking about that, uh, because it really wasn't a village, and it wasn't global. Yeah. Uh, it was maybe national, but even then, if everyone was watching the same thing on television, it wasn't really a village, because people couldn't interact. Yeah. The, the world as it is now has really finally caught up with McLuhan's prescient genius, and I think he'd be very happy. Yeah, and as you're saying, he didn't fit into traditional notions of what scholarship was. Uh, somebody else like Joseph Campbell, it's kind of a similar thing. There's a lot of academic criticism, but you know, the essential genius of what he did was to sort of bleed over the lines of some, one single discipline. 
Absolutely. It seems to me. And the academics who criticize McLuhan and Campbell are either lazy or morons. In, in my opinion. Or envious. Yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely envious. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I remember in, shortly after McLuhan died in 1980 in what would eventually become Digital McLuhan, which wasn't published until 1999, mm -hmm. I approached an editor at, uh, I don't mind saying the name of the press, St. Martin's Press. Mm -hmm. I really can't remember the name of the editor. I said, you know, McLuhan died a few months ago. I have an idea for a book. You know, so, do you really think people are interested in that? I said, I, I know they are. I says, well, a lot of academics may disagree with you. Yeah. And I said, well, you think they really understand McLuhan? I can't get into that. So he wasn't really a bad person. He was just a publisher. He was unwilling to buck these academics. There, there were schools, universities that didn't permit students to cite McLuhan in their PhD dissertations. Oh, okay. And the hmm. problem with the academic world is you know, the whole thing, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach. It's true for yeah. many people in the academic world, except it's even worse than that. The, you know, those who can't think very often go outside of the academic world, and those who can't, who all they can do is basically regurgitate pre-digested knowledge, right. they're the ones who get the position. So it's no bed of roses. And fortunately, however, and it's not only me, there are other, other people, uh, Lance Strait, who founded the Media Ecology Association, which was really based on Neil Postman's work. And mm -hmm. Neil Postman was both Lance Strait and, and my mentor at NYU in the 70s. Okay. But, but uh, Lance Strait is very in tune with McLuhan. Uh, McLuhan's son, Eric McLuhan, is doing some work. I mean, there are people, you know, really around the world who are carrying on this work. Yeah. It's interesting because in your other book, The Soft Edge, you argue that, you know, technology has to fit our needs. And if it's going to evolve, it really has to work with our own human needs. Um, how tough a thing is it for you right now to teach media and communications? Because again, it's such an exciting time. But when students come in and you're teaching, let's say, you know, some some freshmen or you know sophomores in this, um, how do you convey a sense of the possibility of what media can be? Because again, media can be, it seems now, maybe whatever we want it to be. How do you actually teach yeah. that, though? Well, it's never been easier, really, because hmm. the students are not only, and this gets back to what I was saying before, the students are not only consuming media, but increasingly producing media. And this gets back to another great philosopher of the 20th century that I put a lot of stock in, John Dewey, hmm. who, apropos of his name, you know, he was a pragmatist, and apropos of his name, he thought that you couldn't really understand something unless you did it. In other words, you learn through doing, right. uh, as per John Dewey. And as far as understanding the media and getting students excited about it, they're, they're really more than halfway there because they're talking on their cell phones, they're on the web, right. they have iPhones, they have all these connections. In many ways, they know more than I know. You know, it, it, there's a, always a diversity of students. There are some kids in the class who, uh, you know, they're barely even here in 2007 into this digital age. But there are many others who are far more advanced than I am, who've been on Facebook longer than I have, okay. who have, you know, MySpace friends. Uh, so students, things are getting turned upside down. Yeah, almost. they are. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting thing. A student came to me actually with something I hadn't even thought about. To give you an example, just about a week ago, saying, Professor Lemson, what do you think about the fact that on any of these uh, social networks, whether it's MySpace, Facebook, you know, there are really, you know, dozens of them, mm -hmm. you can upload a picture of someone who's not you. For example, a, you can even be a guy and upload a picture of a, of a woman. Sure. And I said, well, yeah, that's an issue. And I, I hadn't really thought of that. And, but of course, what that means, you do have to be careful with you know, what you communicate and reveal online. Mm -hmm. That gets back to, you know, people can use these for bad purposes. But to yeah. your basic question, it's never been easier to teach about the media than it is now. And as you're saying, sometimes they're, you know, giving you some advice about doing things because I know I think you maintain a blog. You have is it four podcasts that, right. you, that you have? Yeah, I mean, right. it's it's interesting when when you look at that. Um, you're a true multimedia person, and uh, you know, again, do you feel that there's an experimental phase, even like I say, to to teaching? Because if you're trying to illustrate a point, you're going to go and say, well, look, look at my podcast. I saw what you went and did last week. Right. Things are getting very Socratic in a sense. Yeah. It's really a dialectic. It is. And one of the things, though, apropos of media satisfying human needs, ever since I started teaching, I've always had a problem of 
what happens if I want the students to hear me talking when I'm not in class? Mm. Uh, that could be for a variety of reasons. The most obvious is perhaps some kind of scheduling conflict arises. But even not that, let's say something happens on a Sunday, there's an important news event. I used to think about this all the time back in the 70s and the other. I had no way of contacting them. This was before email, That's right? That's right. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, you can contact students, you have their email, and with podcasting, you can even talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I've had things where I've interviewed someone on one of my podcasts, and I immediately send out an email to all my students and say, hey, listen to this podcast, we'll talk about it in class next time. Wow. And it's a really liberating thing. And, of course, the video component just adds that, that additional element, which is nice, too. Yeah. If you think of that, you know, that old kind of 1960s folk idea of, uh, you know, people having something to say, uh, do you get the sense that more and more content makers are going to use new media in ways that tr you know, they truly do have something to say and they have, they've been denied a voice before? Do you get the sense that maybe the stage that, that we're in, this kind of Web 2.0, is really, you know, we're on the cusp of something much deeper, hopefully something that really is much more human? Yeah, there's always a trade-off between two trends. And each one has benefits, each one has drawbacks. Mm -hmm. The tradition that we've come from has been a highly gate-kept tradition, yeah. meaning that on the one hand, we can pretty much have confidence in what the media give us because it's been gone over very carefully by editors and producers. But on the other hand, most people have no entree into that as producers. That's right. In the world of what I actually call not just new media, but new, new media, because as you said, Web2, it goes beyond just you know, email, and it gets into production, and it's YouTube, and podcasting, and, and Blip TV. Mm -hmm. In that world, suddenly everyone can have access not only as a consumer, but a producer. The drawback is there could be stuff online that's nonsense, and there's no one to, to stop anyone from doing that. That's right. However, I think that's still, nonetheless, a powerful net benefit. Because I think we've been at the other game so long. <laughs> you know, the game of a tiny n number of gatekeepers telling everyone what they can and the can't elites. see in here. Yeah. Right. Uh, we need more intelligence. We have the intelligence in the world, but we need it into our media so it can get out there and more people can benefit from it. So I'm in favor of it. Yeah, and do you maybe have a prediction of what, you know, sort of a Web 3.0 might look like? If you're taking the idea of video and audio podcasts, uh, what do you think will be the idea of sort of online channels? Is there something that you've had this kind of, uh, you know, this idea in your mind of where things are going to go, something specific that might even be a prediction of what we might see, let's say, in maybe five years. Yeah, I think the, the, the key point now is the technological hardware gadget that we use. Mm -hmm. And I think although it's easy to make too much of the iPhone because other things like BlackBerry, even you know, my Nokia phone, I can get email on it. So iPhone was not the first uh, in effect, cell phone to access the web, right. but it has built into it a direct YouTube connection. It, it is m much more robust than most other cell phones that can access the web. And I talk about this a lot in my cell phone book, which was published in 2004, The Story of the World's Most Mobile Medium, mm -hmm. uh, and how it has changed everything. In five years, I think we are going to have people almost constantly in touch with the web and everything that it has. And, mm -hmm. you know, I refer to the web as the medium of media because even prior to cell phones and these little devices, we could get anything that was ever done in all forms of information on the web. Yeah. The difference now, though, is that we are beginning to get it, not necessarily at our desks, not necessarily we have to go to a place, but any place we go. Yeah. Ultimately, what I think will happen, and this frightens some people, but again, I'm not worried about it. Okay. Um, we'll have an option of, of having a little implant. Uh, we, you know, oh. We're not going to be obligated. The advantage <laughs> of that is, you know, we don't have to worry about losing our cell phone, losing this device, and we'll be able to, you know, do this and then see before our eyes and talk and do everything. We'll be instantly connected. And, hmm. you know, the, obviously there are science fictional, you know, cyborg, you know, nightmares that could come uh, out of this. But right. again... And, I, and you write science fiction I write science well. fiction, right. Yeah. So, right. But I, I'm not really worried about that. I mean, I think, again, it's just more access to information. For me, the decisive point has always been that 
damage is done when we have too little information, not mm. too much information. Okay. Whether we're talking about on the human level, when people get into arguments, you know, when lovers fight, it's because usually they don't have enough information. Mm. Sometimes it's, you know, maybe someone finds out that someone did something, but even so, if they had known more earlier, things could have worked out maybe better. And certainly on a political level, I mean, look at Iraq, look at what happened there. Mm -hmm. uh, l let's even take out of the picture whether Bush and Cheney were doing this deliberately or not. Mm -hmm. At the very least, Americans didn't have enough information. And you know, one of the points that I've made politically is Congress did not do what was required of it under the Constitution, which says you need a formal declaration of war right. to unleash this sort of military action. And perhaps if Congress had taken the Constitution more seriously, they, they would have said then, we don't have enough information. So a lot of it could be essentially access to information, but also the quality of that information, to be able to act on it as a citizen. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Because one thing, you, the more information you have, that also is a great way of highlighting incorrect information. And you know, mm -hmm. apropos of my blog, look, I'm not perfect. And you know, I do a lot of television reviews on InfiniteRegress.tv. I, so I do it for fun. I love television. Sure. And you know, they, they don't make it easy again, the mass media, because if I want to find out who was that person, that woman who was on for like two seconds, you know, 20 minutes into the thing, half the time when you even go to the websites, they don't give a full cast. So right. I do the best I could. I can. I go to IMDb. I look around. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I get it right, but every once in a while I don't. And I had a review of uh, an episode of Mad Men, a great series, and mm -hmm. uh, there was a scene in which Harry Crane is with a character is with a woman, and I identified Harry Crane. He's played by Rich Soma, and I misidentified the woman. Uh oh. And about 15 minutes after I put <laughs> the blog up. Rich Soma himself, who it turned out was reading my blog, put some really? very nice note and say, "Hey, Paul, we, I love your review, <laughs> but you know, you got the the actress's name wrong." And I immediately corrected it. But actually, I mm. like seeing that stuff because that shows that there is a self-corrective quality when you have an open system, like a Wikipedia. That, exactly. And yeah. if I, like uh, some, I think foolish bloggers do, had prevented comments. You know, my blog is sacrosanct. I don't want anybody else. I wouldn't have gotten that that feedback. And you're completely right. Wikipedia constantly has vandals mm -hmm. come on there. Yeah. But the answer is not to close the system. The answer is there are people who are constantly looking at everything, and you know, usually sooner or later they see when there's a mistake. So things should be open source. Correct. Yeah, because yeah. you believe in the power of media to to help shape you know what people do, and that ultimately it'll serve our needs and not us serving the needs of the media. Precisely. Precisely right. Yeah. And that's basically the proper relationship. And that's why even in the dark days of old media, <laughs> I was never worried about the, the media somehow enslaving us as many critics of technology would almost have had it. <laughs> because even then, you know, we could always shut the television off. It's so not that hard. We're the ones who control the media, not vice versa. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And thanks for being with us. We'll see you again soon.